Hello and welcome to Do You See What I See? I'm Yolanda Nava. This afternoon we have a multi-talented guest, filmmaker, producer, entertainment executive, Mokasuma Esparza. Mr. Esparza has garnered more than 100 awards for his committed work across the decades of his life. I'm so delighted to have you here today, Mokde. Thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to be here with you, Yolanda. It's uh... We've known each other for many, many years, and I'm so happy to spend some time with you. Well, I'm very grateful, and I'm grateful for all those years and for grateful for all of your work, Mokde. I'm fascinated that uh, you began a very uh, extraordinary career as a young man. You were an activist, are an activist. You were an activist as well as a film school graduate, and your career just took off from that because you blended the two things together very beautifully. Uh, tell me about how that all started. Well, I was trained to be an activist from a young boy. I, I remember my father taking me on picket marches to support his local union when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. So, and my father talked to me about social justice and history and philosophy, uh, all all my memories of him are uh, of that, of him sharing his worldview with me. So that was the initial training. And then people that ended up being important in my life, my mentors, were also activists who helped train me. So jo Father uh, John B. Luce, uh, the Episcopal Church uh, in, in uh, Lincoln Heights, the Church of the Epiphany. I used to spend... Uh, nights at his rectory and in his basement, uh, talking to him and uh, uh, debating and listening to him about social justice issues. And that became the center, the meeting place for Young Citizens for Community Action that later became Young Chicanos for Community Action and became the Brown Berets and also became UMAS, United Citizens for United Mexican American Students that later became Mecha. All were born in his rectory, in his basement of his church. And we all hung out there. He would take us, uh, the young group that was in uh, Young Citizens Community Action that uh, included David Sanchez, who later was the prime minister of the Brown Berets, and Vicky Castro, who later was elected to the school board and was the chair of LAUSD, uh, and Ralph Ramirez, and. Uh, uh, a whole group of people that um, uh, were all lifelong activists, and we all got trained there. So when I went to UCLA uh, straight out of high school and immediately started organizing the students there, it was because of that background. Uh, Father Luce had taken me on the march from Delano to Sacramento of 1966, and he had taken us to uh, Pickett Safeway and to have uh, food drives for the farm workers and to go to various events. So when I'm at UCLA, I'm helping to organize United Mexican American Students for the very first time. This is in March of 67. Uh, I was already looking uh, to how to impact media. Uh, the walkouts, which had occurred just a little bit later in March of 68, uh, I was a designated media liaison. So I didn't know that I was being trained to be a producer, right? So both in high school and as an activist, uh, the skill set to be a producer is to organize things, to get people to do things, to raise capital, to come up with ideas and to implement them. That was all the training I got as an organizer. Well, it was outstanding training. And I wish I'd had some of that organizational training. And when I think about it, I realized that I probably was dropped into a situation when I did my first television show uh, by Manuel Aragon over at KNBC uh, because he too had a vision for what should be happening in the media and to uh, bring more Latinas at that time, especially into the media and to have greater uh, exposure of our issues and our concerns as well as our presence you know, on television. You also began a career uh, at KNBC television, didn't you? Well, when I was a senior um, and I was looking to what was I going to do when I graduated, and I graduated with a film degree by uh, almost by accident, uh, I thought I'd go and apply to grad school and 
political science or uh, history or something like that. But I got turned down everywhere I applied, even though I was a B plus student, I was a good student, but I was still under grand jury indictment and facing life in jail. So that might have influenced uh, <laughs> why I got turned down everywhere. But the film school wanted me back. And so uh, Eliseo Taylor, African-American professor who recruited me, <laughs> said, you don't, you don't get it. You're a producer. You get people to do things. Uh, that's what your skill set is, and, and you should come back and uh, learn your trade. And so I, I had quite a crisis, actually, about whether or not that was the right move for me. And I had to think it through, and I, and I came to the realization that I could focus on social justice by focusing on changing the image of Latinos in Hollywood. And so that's what I committed myself to do. And my graduate thesis uh, came to be a documentary that I pitched to KNBC, uh, to their documentary unit, uh, that was ultimately called Five Lives. I did a portrait of five people in East LA. And that was my thesis. And I was able to graduate and get out of film school. And I was blessed in that the film won an Emmy. So my first professional film uh, was, was that, Cinco Vidas. I'd made one movie before that as an undergraduate. And that was my undergraduate uh, project too, I guess we, they used to call it. And it was a documentary about August 29th, 1970 and the death of Ruben Salazar, the murder of Ruben Salazar. And that was called Requiem 29. And um, it won a film festival award, a bronze medal at the Atlanta Documentary Film Festival. And was just recently, this, this year, uh, 2022, inducted into the Library of Congress as a significant piece of film, as a, a movie that we merit it's being uh, preserved forever in the Library of Congress. So I was blessed in that I started my career uh, in uh, with some power and uh, reflecting my commitment to social justice. Well, it's been a powerful commitment. And I'm wondering if that uh, focus, that drive, that preparation, that training that you received from various mentors, your father and others, uh, hasn't really guided you throughout your career because you've had a very fortunate career. And I'm curious and interested and fascinated by the themes and the topics of the films that you've done. I mean, you've done uh, Selena, you did uh, Milagro Beanfield War, you did uh, uh, Stand and Deliver, you've done other films that uh, have all been successful. They've all been meaningful and significant in terms of changing attitudes, which is something that you've sought to do. And that I the the selection of your themes is fascinating because you also did the theme uh, the film Gettysburg, which was like you know uh, uh, you would think an entirely different uh, subject area and field, and yet I think you must have been prescient in doing that Gettysburg film because today we're dealing with a lot of the aftermath of what was going on and the conflicts and the divides that existed in our country back in the middle of the eighteen hundreds. So what was it, prescience? Or what was your reason for doing Gettysburg? Well, the commitment that I made when I chose to go to graduate film school is that I would focus on transforming the image of the Latinos in Hollywood and to explore what it is to be human. And that is, is a, a, an immensely broad uh, area of uh, commitment and interest and investigation. What is it to be human? And for whatever reason, I, I am attracted to uh, military conflicts. Mm -hmm. In high school, I had been a cadet lieutenant colonel in ROTC, which not a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. But it, it did serve me in that it gave me some structure uh, in terms of leadership and uh, organization and in terms of setting plans and goals. Um, and it just worked out that. Um, after I had already produced the Milagro Beanfield War and uh, the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez and a movie with Whoopi Goldberg called Telephone mm -hmm. and another movie that I did with um, James Earl Jones and Red Buttons and a few others called The Ambulance, which I did to just prove to myself that I could do a, 
a thriller, uh, a general interest thriller. Um, the writer director of Gettysburg, Ron Maxwell, had been struggling for 10 years trying to get that project off the ground. And Robert Katz and I had gotten to know him, my partner, Robert, of over 30 years. And uh, I read the book, Avenging Angels. No, excuse me, Killer Angels. Avenging Angels is another movie I've made. Yes. And um, it was really compelling to me. Uh, the examples of just how a single choice could have far-reaching consequences and change the future of a country. Um, uh, in, in particular, the um, uh, captain in charge of the main volunteers um, ran out of bullets and ordered a bayonet charge, which mm -hmm. stopped the advance of... Uh, the South in Little Round Top. And uh, that was just an amazing event. And he was a professor of uh, rhetoric, of philosophy, of religion. And he had only read about that particular maneuver. It was an idea to him, nothing that he had ever actually done. But he found himself without any more ammunition on top of a little hill, knowing that if he was overrun, uh, that flank would fall and potentially the entire battle could be lost. And so that moved me. And um, we decided to support Ron Maxwell, Bob and I, and we worked and uh, uh, we got that project uh, sold and produced. And, uh, and then as a consequence of that, it changed my standing in Hollywood. I mean, I was already a legitimate Hollywood producer having done three feature films, two of which had been, no, all three of which had been released by studios. But doing Americana was unexpected. And I was no longer a Chicano producer. I was just a producer. You know, all, all topics, all human interest was now available and open to me. Well, the ideas have power. You know, thoughts are things, ideas, what we build upon them. And that's something I've always admired about you because you've always been immensely focused. And I'm glad I'm discovering this background information because I wasn't aware of all of it. I knew that you had a wise father because of your contribution to It's All in the Frijoles and the Faith chapter, actually. And your beginnings in that way, I saw you had a wise father and I wasn't aware of these other things until more recently. So the idea and the ideas that you had, the commitment that you had really guided your decisions, your opportunities, uh, your possibilities, I think. Well, they did. And uh, uh, another one of my mentors, Fernando Flores, the philosopher, uh, was particularly instrumental in, in uh, opening up my mind to the power of language mm -hmm. and how language creates reality our individual reality, what we think, what we hear, uh, what we think we hear, what we say, creates our individual reality, and then it, a group reality and, and, uh, and uh, a world culture reality. The, the, the world of an Amazonian indigenous person or a Eskimo or a Wall Street banker or a neurosurgeon is all informed by their language and uh, the reality of the world is created through their language and so fernando uh, instructed me on in this and as one of my teachers and mentors i i owe him a great debt and that that also was liberating and allowed me to see all possibilities well possibility is where it is and Speaking of that, what do you see as our possibilities now? I mean, we've moved away. You and I are both first generation in this country. And now we've evolved to the position of 60% of all uh, Latinos, Hispanos in the United States are third and fourth generation Americans. And so what happens to the cultural values, this idea of social justice, which was so much a part of uh, the generation that we come from, which, uh, that, that early Chicano era, uh, how do we maintain these kinds of values, this commitment to social justice uh, with the modern and younger generations? 
Well, I'm reminded of uh, Dr. David Hayes Bautista and his ideas about how the land actually uh, influences who we are and uh, informs and creates our culture. Um, that this actual geography that we have been born in and raised in is indigenous. Uh, and we, we carry that indigenous culture, whether we're speaking Spanish or we're speaking English, uh, we have that still in us and it, it's still coming up always from Donancin, our mother. So for me, it, it doesn't matter whether or not uh, one of my cousins just got here yesterday or uh, others of my cousins have been here in, in the continental United States before the United States existed as a country. Mm -hmm. We're from here. I, I've never, and this is one of the things my father shared with me, and he was from Los Altos de Jalisco. Mm -hmm. He never thought of himself as a immigrant. He was a migrant. He was moving around to work, but he wasn't an immigrant, right? And he crossed the border many times. Uh, he was born in 1900. And he crossed the border in 1917 uh, and many times. And so that was something that I always had with me, uh, a sense of rootedness and uh, a sense that uh, this rootedness would continue forever, as long as I have descendants. It's interesting that you raise this issue about the indigenous aspect because we are indigenous people. I mean, we're a mixture of European and, and uh, 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 according to the United Nations, uh, Negro, uh, uh, indigenous Negro y Popular. Uh, but we have uh, various uh, strains in us. Uh, we have the European, we have the, uh, the Black, the African background. We have the, uh, the uh, indigenous from the Americas. And there was no border. It was a river. <laughs> um, and it's funny that you mentioned this, not funny, but it's, it's very interesting to me that, it, that it, uh, you mentioned this because I've been reading a lot about native elder wisdom that in conversations that uh, the philosopher and comparative religion uh, uh, dean, uh, Houston Smith conducted uh, at a world a parliament of world religions conference in 1999 in Cape Town, South Africa. And the, there's a book and a film based on, on that uh, event. And so this piece of the indigenous history and who we really are, the importance of the land and what they teach is just vital. And it's something that we need to reintegrate into our schools and our teaching and our, our ethics and our morals and our, our classes that we have in school, don't you think? You've talked about, you've developed some curriculums in your experience. Well, yes, this is what the ethos of being a Chicano was always about. We, we claimed in our student group where we would debate these things. You remember, we were both classmates at UCLA and uh, with Juan Gomez and uh, Roberto Cinfuentes and uh, a whole bunch of other groups, uh, you know, individuals. We would debate about who were we and what were we about? And we said, we are estudiantes, uh, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atzlan, right? So in the name of the organization, we were declaring a political and uh, uh, philosophical stand as to who we were, right? So Atzlan was our home, which is the American Southwest. And that is the ancient origins of the Mexica, who are known as the Aztec who are only one tribe of many who migrated uh, from the Bering Strait throughout the entire Americas, right? So Nahuatl it was one of the most widely spoken tongues of that pre-conquest period uh, right here in Southern California. The local tribes spoke Nahuatl, right? They, they knew of the great civilization and empire in the Valley of Mexico. They knew of it. They knew of Tenochtitlan, as did the Navajo and the Apache and the Yaqui, right? So we are all one people. 
Well, there's a great deal of wisdom that I think is to be brought forward and it is being brought forward. And I was delighted that the Parliament of World Religions did that and uh, that the conversations are, are widening now to influence uh, a general public. But how do we keep uh, this going? Because there's so much counter uh, counter narrative that's going on. We're not teaching the real history and the complete history of the expansion and the development of the United States. We don't teach that it was early Mexicanos and Californios in California who prevented California from becoming a slave state. Uh, how do we integrate these concepts into the larger narrative of what we're hearing about in the national media and in our in our schools? We all do our part. You've been doing it all your life. And I hope to continue. You're doing it right now in this platica that we're having. You did it with the publication of It's All in the Frijoles, right? Which is, what is there that is better than a tortilla, chile, and frijoles? <laughs> there is nothing better. <laughs> I will take that any day, any time, over anything else. And why is it? Because my ancient genes, DNA, cry out for it. I love it. So you honored that in your book just by giving it the title. We continue by what we've always done, right? And so our obligation is to replace ourselves. That's our obligation. Well, that's when, an we were young, when we were young, our obligation was to create waves, to open up new territory, to struggle and to fight. And now our obligation is to replace ourselves. And to share wisdom. I yes, that's how we do it. Yes, yes, yes. To share the wisdom, to share the uh, the frijoles, really. Uh, it's, it's all there. It's all there. And I'm amazed when I listen to it now, it's available uh, for the uh, sight impaired and physically handicapped through the Library of Congress Talking Book Program. And when I listen to the book, and the reader's wonderful, uh, his Nahuatl is excellent. And um, it, it's, uh, it, it has even more significance today because of all the hate, doc, and vitriol we've listened to for the, since 2015. And I can't imagine how these young people are hearing all of this uh, uh, opinion of who they are and how difficult it must be for them to counter that. Actually, I think that they're stronger and they have more resources than we did. Okay. And I am far more hopeful about what they will continue to do uh, in building on what we continue to do from our ancestors, right? We have stood on the shoulders and now people are standing on ours. Well, that's important to carry forward. And uh, you, you've done this in so many different ways, mostly through your filmmaking and branching out into uh, more other entrepreneurial things, and we'll have to talk to that in another in another segment. But this has been quite valuable, and and for me, very interesting to learn more about you and the fact that how we how we think and how we shape our lives and who we're influenced by and who our mentors our mentors are very important, and so we have to continue in that role too, don't we? Yes, absolutely. Um, I I cannot see having done anything that I've done in my life without the mentorship of my father and Father Luz, and Sal Castro, and Fernando Flores in particular. And even as a producer in Hollywood, there were significant people, Richard St. John comes to mind, among a few others, that uh, opened up the possibilities that I could navigate Hollywood. And 50 years later, say that I've produced over 50 movies. Mm -hmm over a dozen documentaries, hundreds of short film segments, and dozens of commercials, uh, and have uh, been honored and continue to be recognized uh, to this day. So I'm thankful for that. That is something to be thankful for. And uh, may you have another uh, 20, 25 years to go. <laughs> People are, are lasting a lot longer. And when you have purpose and commitment, that, that enables us to keep going stronger, I think. So what would you say to the young people? I mean, you have you have faith in them. Uh, what what uh, what words of wisdom would you wish to share with them? Well, I I am doing that every day. 
And for me, it is being aware of our ancient, grounded, rooted history that informs who we are and that connects us to our mother. That alone will always give us a path forward. Well, being connected and centered is certainly part of what uh, life is about and about commitment and purpose. And it creates a very beautiful life, which is what you've had of life of family and commitment, uh, which, you know, is ongoing. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Mokte. It's been a wonderful experience to uh, be with you again. Uh, it's been day. lovely, Yolanda. We, yeah. we used to have many gatherings together where our children spent time together. And uh, those were beautiful times. And uh, let us hope that they, we can return to that. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before we uh, tune out today, I want to uh, share with the audience that uh, my book, Through the Dark, has won two gold awards and one silver award at the International Latino Book Festival. So I invite you to pick up your copies and share them with friends. And also, I want to let you know that next month, October, we have a wonderful guest coming up, Susana Guzman, the opera star. And she's somebody you will not want to miss. So thank you so much for joining us on To Do You See What I See? I'm Yolanda Nava. <laughs>